Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. This is uh, Dave Morris from Cybersecurity, the No Spin Zone, and today we're we're going to be discussing the topic of blockchain and um, uh, its applications, um, all all of that great stuff. Um, so, this is part of the Ask the Expert series, and uh, we'll go into whatever detail. Feel free to ask questions. Any questions that we do not get to uh, answer, um, I will I will give my email address out at the end uh, in uh, in a uh, audience announcement, and you can contact me, and we'll get your questions answered that way. So, uh, with that, I just want to take a quick moment and introduce uh, our presenters. Uh, everyone knows me. I'm Dave Morris. I'm the moderator of the um, Cybersecurity No Spin uh, No Spin Zone uh, channel, and with me is uh, uh, Peter uh, Peter Park. Yeah. Did, I, did I just butcher your last name, Peter? A little bit. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Peter is the director of information security at Flashpoint. Uh, he's an adjunct uh, professor at NYU, um, and he can go into a little bit of his own background when when we get around to Peter. When I hand off to Peter, um, he he is a uh, a blockchain uh, crypto expert. Understands it. Teaches it. Uh, with us is Ulf Matson, who is the head of innovation at TokenX, and um, Ulf. Ulf has been around the block and is, is part of this uh, channel. Everyone has uh, seen and heard Ulf. He's also intimately familiar with um, encryption, tokenization, hashing, all the things that are necessary to a blockchain. So um, with that, I, I will hand it over to Peter, and you can uh, you take it there, Peter. Sounds good. Thank you very much, David. Thanks uh, for having me here. Uh, and um, yeah, let's just jump right into it. Today we're going to be talking about blockchain and a little bit about Bitcoin and how all of this works. Um, as uh, David mentioned, uh, my name is Peter Partika. I'm uh, the Director of Information Security at Flashpoint. Um, I've been in the security field uh, for, for a very, very long time. I've also uh, been doing a lot of uh, blockchain work in the financial sector prior to moving into the security field full time. Uh, I, I'm a self-proclaimed blockchain enthusiast, and I have a hashtag forever noob on there because uh, I think we're all forever noobs. We're always learning. We're, uh, this field is always changing, and I think it's uh, really important to, uh, to to always grow in this field. So um, next, I want to talk about a little bit um, the, uh, what we're going to be talking about in my side of the presentation, and uh, we're going to be going into high-level concepts such as ownership and value. Uh, the weakness of central uh, authorities, and historical references. I think this is really important because uh, the ideas of uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain have been around for, for quite a long time. It's just about putting all those, uh, all those pieces together and, uh, and coming up with something new. Uh, then I'm going to go into do the blockchain technical details, and finally, some notes on consensus and fault tolerance. And I'll also mention in some of the newer technologies uh, in, in the form of uh, smart contracts and whatnot, but I think um, Alt is going to cover that as well. So uh, let's move forward. Let's talk about the store of value. So that for, first bu bullet point is shamelessly taken off of uh, Wikipedia. right? Um, the store of value is the function of an asset that can be saved, uh, retrieved, exchanged at a later time, and be predictably useful when retrieved. Um, the, what you have to remember for this uh, for this uh, this presentation for blockchain and Bitcoin is that value a value in, in general is a is a human construct. We assign value to objects. If somebody is willing to buy a share of Tesla at two hundred and fifty dollars, and somebody is willing to share it uh, or, or buy or sell that share for that price, they have a pre agreed on that value. And um, I get a lot of questions about Bitcoin and its value. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the simple answer is that enough people are willing to pay 17 grand for a Bitcoin, now down to seven grand. Um, but that is between the buyers and the sellers. And, and if there were no humans, the concept of value would, would not be there. Uh, next is the concept of ownership. So this is also uh, relatively, uh, uh, a relatively simple and abstract concept. Uh, does possession 
equal ownership. If I give you an item, does that explicitly mean that you own it? If, uh, if I give you the item with the intent of you owning it, that does mean you own it. But when we talk, start talking about bigger items, uh, more significant items, whether it's a car or a house or property or shares of a company, how does, how does that ownership work? Right? Where, where is that tracked? Right? And where is that agreed upon? What's the central authority that trusts that ownership? And I mean, the short answer to that question is ledger. Ledgers, uh, in, you know, uh, most ledgers uh, hold um, ownership value, wh whether it's deeds of a house in your bank or, or deeds to a car, or uh, it's all written down in ledgers. So I, I do have an example here of um, the United States um, total um, monetary value, where it's, it's valued at r roughly $75 trillion um, the U.S. holds in assets. Right between all the different uh, economics for the economic geeks, there's the M1, the M0, the M2. When they add it together into M3, is roughly 75 trillion of all to total monetary value. Right, but you may be surprised to know that of that total monetary value, six percent of that is on currency. Actual physical dollars. There's only six percent of that on currency. The rest is in ledgers. And trust me when I say some of these ledgers are actually books with notes and, and papers written down. They're, they haven't all been transferred into databases and banks yet. So this concept of ledgers I think is really, really important um, to, to, uh, to grasp when we're talking about Bitcoin and the blockchain and also uh, value and ownership. Right? So uh, moving on, <clears throat> excuse me, what else is on ledgers? Uh, money as we just talked about, uh, but also uh, our identity. Our voting records, those punch cards, right? Education and certification. Everyone that has a degree, I'm sure there's a university somewhere where, where there's an there's a entry written down on a piece of paper who has what degree. It may have been transferred to a database, maybe not. Uh, land and buildings, this is also on ledger. Intellectual property, all this, patents, th these are on ledgers, right? So who stores, the, this leads us to the questions, right? Like who stores these valuable ledgers and why do we trust them? Right? Why, do, why do we trust these central authorities? Right? So these are the concepts um, that we have to remember when talking about Bitcoin and the blockchain. So, so Peter, this, this, uh, this is Dave. So mm -hmm. I, I equate a ledger um, to just a, a, an official record of who owns what, when, and why, where, and how. That yep, is, that's uh, that, okay. That, that, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Who owns what, when, how, how when, and how? Where and also how? how yeah. And and also how much of it, right? Exactly. Uh, exactly. So you might you might hear the term double entry ledger, where for every transaction uh, there is an opposing side of that transaction. Same. Yeah. Same concept. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so, right. Uh, so we. I just want to address uh, two questions that came in. Uh, the this this session is ninety minutes uh, long. We 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 increase the time because. We figured there would be a lot of questions, and we didn't want to rush it. Um, and one question someone asked, Peter, just as an aside, uh, your background, when did you pivot to working on blockchain in the commercial world? So, uh, so when, when, when Satoshi Nakamoto came out with his paper in 08, I probably read the paper in 09. And um, as soon as uh, I was working for a hedge fund, which shall remain nameless, but as soon as the fund manager read this white paper, automatically get as much information on this as you can. Will this be big? Okay. Right? So uh, I think uh, officially uh, it was 2010 is, is when people uh, started to uh, like professionally ask me about this stuff. And gotcha. uh, I, I also worked with some startups and fintech that did blockchain work. Um, you may, heard, may have heard of uh, Overstock.com as an adopter. They, uh, they acquired a company for, um, uh, that did a lot of work. Uh, and we wrote an API called Venn.io. It's a, it's a long history. I can, uh, I can say, give my contact information. We can talk about okay. that more. I just, just want to get that out of like, I'm sorry. Sh sure. Go ahead. No, no, no worries. No worries. So, um, so ledgers. Yeah. So uh, 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 as mentioned. So let's move on. Um, let's talk about the historical references. Would you guys believe me if I told you that 1,500 years ago the concept of a prototypical blockchain existed? I think the, the, the common answer is no. But, uh, but let, let, me, uh, let me make an anthropological uh, uh, statement here. The Yap people of micro, current day Micronesia, their, their form of currency were, were massive rocks, some of them four meters in diameter and four tons, right? You can't carry these things around, right? So how did they trade them? How did they ascribe ownership to these things, 
uh, right? And, and I think it's a very interesting concept because the, the way they did this is they had a community meeting and the heads of families and, and, and major heads of the community would come to this meeting. And during this community me meeting, the transaction would be announced to the entire, uh, uh, to the entire village or population. They would say, Peter is giving Alice this four-ton block that is on this island in this location. And then that information uh, went uh, to the brains of everyone in that meeting, and then everyone in that meeting went to their homes and their families and told them who owns these new things, or we traded our rock to this family, or so on and so forth. And think of these people's brains as a ledger in this case. That's exactly. distributed acro across the community, right? Like, and there's, uh, everyone heard it. There's no uh, room for misconception or anything there. I think it's, uh, it's a very accurate description of what the blockchain is um, in a non-technical way, right? And the, secure, and the security was the fact that it was four metric tons. Right, exactly. No one's going no yeah. to lift a four metric ton rock. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, yeah. So, so enter uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto in 08, right? Uh, so this is the white paper that changed everything. Um, uh, and uh, I, I have in parentheses over here on the slide, it's only nine pages long, and it's amazing how nine pages can really change what, what, what we're doing here. Uh, but the, the paper came out in 08, right? It describes uh, what would later be called a blockchain. The term blockchain is not actually in the paper. They called it a distributed timestamp server. Um, which is essentially a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger. I'm going to go into that in, in the next slide. Uh, they also talk about a proof-of-work concept that has been around for, for a very long time, the network propagation mechanisms of how you would uh, distribute this ledger knowledge to, to, to everyone uh, who's on the network, and, of course, the consensus mechanisms, uh, things like pre preventing the 51% attack. And, and I'll go into uh, what, what that means in, in detail in a little bit. So... Uh, from, so this is the paper that, that, that started it, uh, it all. There we go. And uh, let's talk about a, a couple of network types, because I think it's important to understand these network types when we're talking about blockchain. Um, the three ma major network types are centralized, decentralized, and distributed. So when we're talking about a centralized network, uh, we're usually talking about a central authority. Right, uh, meaning that central authority clears all the transactions, or in the term of routing, right, like uh, your core router, uh, right. If that router goes down and you have no high redundancy uh, setups there, high availability setups, your entire network goes down, right. So it, it's um, it can be very unstable. Uh, it's relatively easy to maintain, and there is one central authority in a centralized network. In a decentralized network, there are several authorities, right. The internet is the best example of these, right. When when uh, one authority in, uh, on the internet goes down, all traffic is theoretically rerouted, right? Routing protocols automatically find a consensus, important word, to reroute the traffic through, um, uh, through the network to get to its de uh, destination, right? And the last type of network uh, is dis a distributed network where there are no central authorities. And ju just like the, uh, during the Yappies example, uh, everybody's brain was the ledger, in the in a decentral and distributed network, sorry, um, every node ha has the the source of truth, or in, in this case, which would be uh, the the blockchain, right? So, the blockchains are distributed ledgers, and um, and we're going to go into that uh, in a second as well. But before okay, we do just, that, just 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 want to interject. Uh, people are asking sure. if slides will be made available or emailed later. Yes, I sent out a uh, presenter to an audience announcement with my email. Uh, David Morris at MorrisCybersecurity.com, and just email me, and I'll I'll get those I'll get those out to you. I'm sorry, Peter. Go ahead. Yep. Um, there's a KYC question that, that we, we yeah. Why don't you go ahead and take that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how does blockchain help in KYC? So for those of you who don't know, KYC is know uh, know your customer. Uh, basically, it's the due diligence performed when and when. Um, uh, doing uh, financial transactions. It also pairs nicely with AML laws, anti-money laundering laws. So how does the blockchain help with that? So the blockchain inherently, blockchain uh, technology uh, may help with that by having a permissioned ledger between all the financial uh, institutions. And in order to accept the node onto that distributed network, you would have to go through that same due diligence process. But also, the transactions on the blockchain are done via a private key. And that gets into the concepts of non-repudiation. If, if this is you and you own right. this private key and you do this transaction, you can't say that you didn't do this tr transaction. 
So that's how, and, and this is cryptographically verifiable, and I'm going to go into that in a couple of uh, slides. Ab absolutely. Yeah. So next, let's talk about the proof of work concept. And I think this is, um, uh, so th there are, there's also proof of stake, which we're not going to get into in too much detail, but I think the proof of work concept here is really important to know uh, because people are like, well, what is a miner? What, what does that mean? How does Bitcoin get created? Does it, does it come out of nothing? Uh, and and the, the answer is it's all via a proof of work concept. So I'm going to get into a little bit of a technical example and uh, and bear with me, everybody. So uh, when we have an, uh, a network, a distributed network of nodes, um, the network issues a challenge string, right? So this could be an arbitrary string of, uh, of whatever length, it doesn't matter. Um, and, the, and it's the job of that network, that distributed network as a whole, to find a proof for that string to meet an arbitrary set of criteria. So for example, um, the challenge string can be issued, it could be A, B, C, D, E, F, and uh, the proof would have to be a string that when concatenated with the challenge string and put right. through a one-way hashing uh, algorithm, uh, that, that the criteria would be that the first four bits of that answer are zeros, right? So that means every node on the network has to come up with proof strings that one concatenated with the challenge string and SHA-256, uh, the first X bits are zeros, right? So once that criteria is met, um, then, then the proof of work has been done. And this is what we call mining. When, when, when you solve this challenge tree, when a proof has come up, that means a new block is formed, right? So that's what, what mining means. So that implicitly means that the p-value, the proof value, is computationally intensive. It's very, very intensive. And, uh, but it also means that since SHA-256 is, is an open source known algorithm that everybody can use, the cryptography can be instantly verified. You take the challenge string, you take the proof string, you put them together, you run them through a SHA-256, if uh, the first X number are zeros, then you know that the proof is real, and then the new challenge string is issued. Right? And, and uh, one, one, one comment I'd like to make, um, Peter, uh, and to the audience underlying all this, is, is that in, in the cryptographic world, which is the world I used to live in, still do, um, all of these algorithms, hashing algorithms, encryption algorithms, are published. And it's sort of like an, a, an, an explicit invitation to break it. And, and try to break it. And the, the fact that it's published and no one has been able to say, you know, I've broken this algorithm or whatever, um, stands as a testament to, to its strength. It's not a proprietary-based um, view of the world. Correct. And I think that's a very important concept, is that these hashing algorithms are public and mathematicians are crunching to see if they could break them, and, and that uh, the collective hive mind, as they call it, uh, uh, is right. doing its own hashing to try to break these algorithms. And so far, SHA-2 is, uh, is pretty good, or SHA-256, same thing. So, so someone, asked, so, someone, asked, someone asked a question, Peter. I guess this might be the place that, to ask it. He said, nothing is unhackable. How long do you pre uh, predict until a major uh, blockchain network is hacked? So, uh, so uh, I can't predict the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but if uh, so, uh, I'm going to get into the 51% attack. So there are a couple of attacks that you can do against the blockchain network or this blockchain system uh, that already exist and that already have proof of concepts. Um, but the computing power necessary is, is prohibitive. Meaning, uh, unless you're a nation state and can spin up 51% of the entire uh, blockchain network, it's very difficult to do. It's, uh, exactly. less about hack it's less about hacking the actual blockchain network and more about, let's say, delaying somebody's transaction. And I'll get into uh, this very uh, clear specifics of that in a later slide. So, um, so with proof of work, once this proof of work has been solved, uh, then uh, that solution is propagated through the network onto a distributed ledger, right? So I think it's really important to note here, going back to the ledger example, the same as in accounting, a block in a blockchain is a timestamped record of transactions, right? So if the blockchain is a ledger, a block is a page of that ledger, and a transaction is one line on that page. And I think it's also important to mention that there's an optional memo field 
called Opreturn, and this is Bitcoin specific, meaning specific to the Bitcoin blockchain. There could be many types of blockchains. But the, mm-hmm. but the memo field, you, uh, entire companies have built business par- um, uh, models around this, uh, storage, counterparties, so on and so forth. They, they have built, they have put uh, things into the Opreturn field that allow them to mark transactions or even put bytecode into this uh, memo field, and this bytecode can execute something. And that, that gets into SCART, uh, smart contracts a little bit, which we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. So, once, uh, so I think it's important to know that, so we're moving from uh, the proof of work, it's then propagated onto this distributed ledger. How is it propagated onto this distributed ledger? And I think this is really important because this gets into the Merkle tree. So yeah. uh, this propagation, uh, the way this happens is that um, every, uh, blocks are records of transactions, and the, these records of transactions are filling up. Miners on the network are finding, w- looking for that proof. Once that proof has been found, that block then, j- then gets written onto the blockchain. And it's important to note that the hashing time may vary because we're trying to brute force this proof string. I think in a couple of years ago, maybe it was 2012, it took three days for a transaction to clear because no one found the actual proof string yet, right? Mm-hmm. And, but, but the average, average time to, uh, across the entire network to, um, to find a proof string is about 10 minutes. And that's why it can take sometimes 10 minutes for transactions to clear. And this gave the uh, birth to escrow services that allow you to clear the transactions quickly and so on and so forth. But, but what I want everyone to take away from this Merkle tree is that when you have this block and all these transactions are put into this block that, uh, and, and a proof is found, that block is then run through a one-way uh, hashing algorithm, SHA-2, and that signature, it gets put into the top or into the header of the next block so that, that there's a record of all these transactions that have been hashed uh, and that, per, that uh, uh, has the integrity uh, that makes the blockchain ha- have a implicit built-in integrity, meaning that if you change the hashes of any one of these blocks, um, the entire thing falls apart. Uh, I hope that made, uh, made sense because I think that's really, really important, uh, is that the integrity of the blockchain makes it immutable, uh, and right. it's through hashing algorithms that, that this happens. So and maybe, maybe, maybe you want to... Um, because I'm not sure the the um, technical uh, acuity, what the how technical the audience is, but it may be worth spending a moment talking about a hashing algorithm and the fact that it's a one-way function, what we call a one-way tag. You can't reverse engineer it. It's it's Correct. like you said, it's immutable. It's um, Right, right. So so um, uh, a hashing algorithm takes uh, take, uh, takes an input. And that input is arbitrary. It could be anything. And from, from the bytes in that input, from, from all the bytes that comprise that input, you are, then get a fingerprint, uh, which is another string of characters, such that this fingerprint will always refer to those same bytes. So if you change any one of those bytes, that entire fingerprint changes. Uh, so that, that's how a hashing al- a algorithm works. And, and that's uh, what helps make the blockchain immutable and preserve, preserves the integrity of the, of the blockchain. So hopefully the, that made sense. Yes, so thank you. Let's talk about consensus because this is, uh, this is where we get, in the, in, get into a little bit of the attacks and, uh, and also the, the blockchain network because the consensus mechanisms here is one of the, the big selling points here. Um, you can put two conflicting transactions onto the blockchain. Let me repeat that. Anyone can put conflicting con- transactions onto the blockchain. This is possible. So, for example, if I send David one Bitcoin and I only have one Bitcoin and then I send Ulf another Bitcoin, which one of those transactions makes it onto the blockchain? So, this is where consensus comes in. And the, the short answer to that question is the transaction that w- reaches 51% of the nodes first is going to make it onto the blockchain. The, the, all the other transactions will get discarded. And uh, the technical term in blockchain land is called orphaned or stale blocks. These become stale blocks that do not make it onto the blockchain. So um, in order to attack the blockchain itself, you would have to own 51% of the hashing power so that you can make uh, uh, your transactions be the canonical transactions of the, uh, of the blockchain. And uh, this is also time-based. You would have to... Uh, it, it really is based on who 
uh, sends the transaction first. So if uh, if I send my mm-hmm. transaction to David first, it starts being propagated onto the network, and then I send my transaction to Alt. Alt's transaction is always going to be n minus one uh, behind David's transaction, my transaction right. to David, and that uh, and that uh, and that really makes it very very difficult unless there's some real network problems uh, to um, to uh, to hack this system, uh, quote unquote. So I, I think that's uh, that's a very important uh, concept to to grasp. It, so it, it is, and, and there was a question that came in uh, relative to consensus. It says, um, person asked, in a permissioned environment, um, a permission blockchain, what advantage does one get by distributing the data across several nodes? Is a consensus mechanism even needed? Uh, there is a central uh, there is a central authority of trust, since somebody must control access. Correct. That, that, uh, so that's is, a great is question. a permission blockchain even a blockchain? Right, right. Uh, so it's a blockchain in the fact that, that it's immutable and it's cryptographically verifiable. But a permission blockchain, uh, so there are a couple of implementations of com- permission blockchains. For example, if you take a bunch of big banks, uh, Barclays, Chase, HSBC, so right. on and so forth, right? And, and if all of these banks have a shared and permissioned blockchain to execute trades, for example, or execute swaps, um, uh, the, the value comes in that these banks are inherently competitors, right? So, um, uh, it, it, and also, how about I throw in a, a third? Uh, so we have a bunch of banks on this hypothetical permission blockchain, and the permission is only for yeah. these banks to write onto these blockchains. I'm going to add in a not, not, a not a bank entity. I'm going to add in SEC compliance. What if SEC compliance also has part of that blockchain, such that compliance can be live, immediate, and independently verifiable 100% of the time when these transactions happen, right? Right. So uh, to answer the question, is it even a blockchain? It is from a crypto perspective. Um, right. But, but uh, when, when we're talking about permissioned and internal bl- blockchains, meaning blockchains internal to a specific company and not shared or verified through an outside party, then why, why, are you just, why don't you just keep your transactions in the database? It's essentially the same thing. Right. And um, I mean, and, and you, you, can, you can get really granular with going into this argument. But but, but that, that's the yeah. the, tr- the trust system here is, is what we have to talk about. Are we trusting uh, that everyone in this permissioned local blockchain is doing the right thing as opposed to distributing this blockchain uh, uh, along multiple competitive entities? Right. Right. Yeah. So hopefully that answers the question. OK, before. Um, so um, before. Before you end your set of slides, um, we 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 yeah. uh, pivot over to uh, Ulf. Um, okay, keep, sure. keep, I want to ask yeah. you some questions. Go ahead. Sure, sure, sure. Oh uh, yeah, so I, I'll just, I'll just put it all together. Uh, so this last slide Great. is just a sum- summary of everything we've just talked about. So what, in the terms of uh, in terms of Bitcoin, Bitcoins are created whenever a new block is written onto the blockchain. Right. Uh, remember that the blockchain is uh, is a ledger, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, there are transactions in that ledger, right? Uh, and these blocks are written onto the blockchain in chronological order of transaction, right? And miners are responsible for verifying the proof of work as well as uh, mm-hmm. the transactions that happen on this ledger. And that proof of work is a computationally intensive problem that has to be solved in order to even get a block onto this network. And lastly, right. c- consensus. Uh, unless you own 51% of the network, um, it, it's going to be really hard to, to fudge these transactions onto the ledger. And that's, that's Bitcoin and the blockchain in a very, very high level. And over here on the right, I have a little picture of a bunch of different technologies that are using blockchain that are not just currency. There are other types of technologies that are using it as well. So go, go ahead. Okay. All right, so let's let's fire off. I'm going to fire off some questions to you. And also, if you if you want to answer, chime in before. Um, even though we're we're going to get to your set of slides momentarily, but I want to get these uh, questions that the okay. audience is uh, coming in with. Um, let's see here. Um, let me start with this. Uh, th- there's one question I'm going to save to the end because it's really controversial. Um, here's one question. Peer-to-peer or bilateral trading is a property of the original primitive markets, trading in goods and services or bartering. On the other hand, things such as market making, central clearing, and central regulated exchanges are properties of highly um, – let's see here. I, uh, I'll get 
here. Our properties of highly efficient involved markets. Why do you think we would move back to peer to peer training, trading? Uh, so uh, the question is, why do I think we'll move back to peer to peer trading? Yeah. Uh, so so uh, maybe uh, I wasn't clear. I'm not sure if we will move back to peer to peer trading. Yeah. I still, I don't I still, think so. I, I, I still think there will be uh, there will be peer to peer, but there will be uh, so if you're if you're on a blockchain that could all be verified, uh, even and you could put the central authority, a clearinghouse, onto that blockchain to verify that that transaction. Uh, right. So so I, I may have uh, not gotten that out uh, correctly, so I apologize if that's the case. That's okay. I don't think we'll um, I don't think we'll, we'll move into a peer to peer system. No, that's my mistake. And then here's another question. So all miners are computing on the same block, or does the mining occur on every node? Uh, so not everyone's a miner. Um, um, so, but every node of the uh, uh, every node of the network uh, yeah. that, that that is a miner it, it facilitates the creation of blocks. Right. Does that answer your question? Because you could just you can just download the blockchain and just have a local wallet. And you're not you're not you're not a miner, uh, exactly. right? So you're you're not completing drops, but you could put transactions onto the blockchain, but they won't be cleared until a miner uh, uh, completes a a, a a proof. Someone asked this question, and I'm not sure I understand it. You might. How does it work with bones in mining? Are you uh, going to answer with respect to consensus? What once again? How does uh, it work with bones in mining? Are you going to answer with respect to consensus? I'm, I have, I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, I'm not sure I understand it either. So. Yeah, all right. Then we'll, we'll, Sorry. No, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, is there any legal limitations in implementing blockchain licensing, for example? Uh, so so uh, I'm going to preface this question with I'm not a lawyer. Uh, yeah, but, exactly. but, 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 the, but the source is open, and, and people are, banks are, Already implementing uh, blockchains internally for testing. Um, so, right. as for uh, the, the, I think the problem is like uh, getting to market first here uh, isn't uh, isn't as beneficial as it normally would. As a lot of people would have to accept the technology as a whole before it, it becomes uh, reputable, right? So, if you say I have this awesome system where you can clear transactions on my blockchain, and mm -hmm. no other bank has this blockchain, that's going to be a problem. So from a legality perspective, I think the technology has to be accepted uh, by both a, a legal, um, right. from a legal a perspective, a regulatory perspective, and of course uh, uh, from the market perspective. When I say market, I mean and the, right. the people that matter have to buy into this. Right. So you know, my take on that, and again, not a lawyer, um, legal limitations in implementing a blockchain. There probably aren't any legal limitations in implementing a blockchain. If you want to be a blockchain uh, exchange of some sort, um, then you're then you're going to have to fall under a sort of state uh, regulatory um, uh, review process. And I know New York State, um, for Bitcoin as an example, uh, has uh, shut down, has drafted laws and rules and regulations for setting up uh, a, a Bitcoin exchanges. So, um, right. So, so yeah, I, I think. It, it, uh, absolutely. So New York State in particular has the DSF, uh, Depar uh, Department, right. sorry, DFS, Dep Department of Financial Services. And if you're a bank or an exchange, you have to have a bit license in order to do blockchain transactions. Additionally, block, uh, um, the IRS classifies blockchain as a, uh, as a type of asset, and you have to have federal right. regulatory SEC, FTC compliance to that as well. Okay, an another question. Where are all the nodes stored in reality? Apparently anyone can download that a uh, node, or is it just a small group of miners? Yeah, so and, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the, the short, cheeky answer is everywhere. Nodes are everywhere. Yeah. Any, anyone can download a, a node, and anyone can start mining locally on their own computer. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the fact that it's distributed, uh, it's open to the world, anyone can do it. So if the answer is where are they, uh, there are a lot of mining nodes uh, in, in the U.S. They're also in, in China, in Europe. Uh, they're, they're, the short answer is everywhere. And yeah. um, when, when the blockchain and Bitcoin in the blockchain, so I'm, I'm referring to those specific blockchains right now, when they started, right. it, it was more like a do it at home, put some graphics card together, Nano Fury chips yeah. came out. Like, right, like the, uh, it, it was the, the network was distributed among home users. 
uh, and there right. were enough of them, uh, and there were enough of them, so that there were, uh, that that it per, uh, you know uh, the network works fine. And but as as time came out, as Nano Fury chips came out, uh, chips made specifically for uh, uh, running these algorithms came out. Um, people started to buy up these chips and buy out data centers to do just this entire business model exactly. to build on just this, and it, it started to become almost like this cartelized uh, network. Yeah, and so here's a question which sort of related to that. Um, Hacking, it's a hacking question. Private key hacking is being considered secure until quantum computers are a reality. I think Correct. they are a reality. It's a, it's a question of an affordable reality. Uh, before this point, no countermeasures need to be implemented. So it's sustained um, more than a question. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, think, I think that the quantum computers are a reality. Once we have enough qubits in order to, uh, to, to, to make right. a, a, a dent, I think it's going to be a really big problem. Uh, uh, until then, the blockchain, as designed, is is immutable and cryptographically verifiable. Uh, but yeah. quantum computer quantum computing is a game changer in many ways. And do you, do you um, do you believe there will be a way to speed up the transaction time in the near future? I mean, as, other yeah. So so that that that's the hashing power of the proofs. These proofs get right. exponentially harder each time. It started out with four zeros. I think it's up to twelve zeros. That means the SHA has has to have. 12 zeros preceding it right now. And um, right. I think uh, um, I don't like quoting Moore's Law a lot, but, but um, <laughs> um, as, uh, as processing power in increases in theory, uh, uh, right. the transaction time will decrease. And that, that gets into quantum computing as well. It, it'll be almost nothing if we have a, a real quantum computer with enough qubits. Right. And, and, and oh, please chime in any of these questions too. Um, do you guys think there are any studies to identify the minimum number of nodes to be on the safe side of trust? So is there like a tipping point? Right, right. Uh, the, yeah, so uh, I'm going to re rehash that question. Uh, yeah, is, the question <laughs> is the, no, is no the question is the question Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the question uh, how many nodes uh, equal 51%? If uh, if that's yeah. the question, uh, yeah, if if that's the question, um we don't know. Uh, we don't know, and I'm not sure if there are any studies being done on that. Right, right. Um, and then um, someone asked, "How does blockchain protect privacy?" I think you, you feel free to answer uh, yeah. that. I think that goes sure. to the hashing. Yeah. So, so, so I, I think how does blockchain for uh, so the, the the short cheeky answer to that question is it doesn't. Uh, unless, unless, quote, there's a big asterisk here. Uh, un unless you never uh, publish your uh, your wallet address anywhere. So if you create a wallet address um, uh, and and you only do transactions with that wallet address and you don't put that wallet address anywhere and, and none of your social media, not, nothing that's attributed to you, you can um, you, you can protect uh, uh, a lot of your transactions and the privacy thing. But but I think wh where people are like um, get confused here is that all those transactions are on that ledger. So right. if you if you have that wallet and with that wallet address you're doing a, a lot of illegal transactions, they are immutable. They will always be on that ledger. So that means if if anyone finds out that that wallet is attributed to you, uh, it's game over. Right. Right. Um, another question. There's more questions. Um, how do we determine whether an application is better served by a blockchain solution, or as opposed to or a database or a cloud? Right, right. Put everything into Elasticsearch. Right. So, so yeah. that that's that's a great question, and, and and I don't think there there's a there's an answer to that. I think you have to go through a threat modeling exercise. I think you have to go through yeah. a business exercise. And um, uh, in the slide that I had previously, with what information it lives on ledgers, voting, money, houses. Yeah. That that type of stuff is relatively public record, uh, and having that immutable, I think there's there's a benefit to that. Uh, mm -hmm. But and uh, but again, with the asterisk that it's shared through multiple trusted authorities, uh, right? So it's it's a difficult question to to answer. I, I don't know the, the the clean answer to that question. I, there isn't one. Um, yeah. How big of a threat is novelization of current blockchains? Uh, for example, Bitmain. Uh, how, how big of a, a, a threat is of, of a threat <laughs> is the monopolization of, of current blockchains? I so, so yes. Yeah, so so I hate responding to a question uh, with a question, but uh, I guess the a threat to what exactly? Um, uh, threat, so, to, so, threat threat to a bit becoming a monopoly. Right. Right. So uh, so. The, the, um, 
Yeah, so in, 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 by, by its nature, a distributed uh, ledger uh, cannot, uh, by definition, become a monopoly. But, but again, if somebody owns 51% of those nodes, that eventually makes them the, the, the power holder. Um, I think there are enough interested parties uh, as we currently are to not have that happen. I know uh, mm -hmm. China's putting in a lot of uh, nodes. I know uh, the e e yeah, a lot yeah. of states in, in the EU and the US and even South America are putting in a lot of nodes uh, right. to prevent that from ha from happening. Um, but uh, I don't know what, what the actual threat is here. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, sure. I mean, it, sure. it, can, it, can, it can happen if you have 51% of, right. of the nodes. It, it can happen. Right, and there's also the, uh, you know, I don't know that we talked a lot about um, a, a public um, versus a private. Um, right, right, uh, yeah. So, so, so all, all, all those concerns are related to a public blockchain, i.e., the right. one that that Bitcoin's on, as opposed to a permissioned or a private blockchain where where it's internal only, and then uh, therefore you can regulate who has how many nodes and so on and so forth. So do you think DNS hacking uh, will impact uh, the blockchain? Uh, so mm. uh, I, 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 it can, but, but not directly. It would right. be I, I, indirectly. Um, uh, the, the attacks would have to be indirect. The, the actual blockchain itself uh, will not be compromised by DNS uh, hacking uh, because of how the protocol works. But, but uh, there, there are things in intercepting transactions and in terms of, uh, of phishing, uh, that you can um, redirect um, transactions, and, and but that's that's a different problem. Um, sure. I sure. think a, a lot. So, so we're, uh, I'm I'm just going to chime in here. A lot of the things that we've been seeing with like Mt. Gox and and, the, and these different exchanges being hacked and whatnot. I think uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, the people who are building blockchain technologies and exchanges uh, recently. Uh, devs that come out of school are superstar devs and they're really good at development, right? And and they want to get a product out fast and 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 make an ROI on there. And I'm not going to get into the ICO market, but yeah, but, the, no. the, the, but but most devs um, and um, are aren't uh, trained to develop securely in the same way that banks are in theory. Uh, trained to develop security. Security for a bank, for a major right. investment bank, it has been an existential crisis for a very, very long time, right? Um, uh, and, and that I think there's a very different paradigm there uh, with the, the modern implementations versus the old school implementations. I got you. How long until widespread adoption of, blo of, the, of blockchain technology? Uh, and I'll give you my viewpoint, then I want to hear what you guys think. I think it depends on the uh, application, the industry, um, you know what what it's being used for. Certain industries are going to go to it real fast, and others are just going to take a wait and see approach. But you guys, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I will, I will show some statistics and predictions yeah. for different industries. Right, and, and I think I think it's adoption. Who, if if some of the bigger industries starting adopting, the quicker it adopts, the more it will adopt. So it's hard to predict. Sure. And, any chance to use blockchain for VR slash AR? Um, so if uh, if your VR AR technology um, uh, it requires you to have a a public uh, immutable source mm -hmm. of, of of data, um, then the applications are endless. But from a technology perspective, I think it may slow down VR and AR as those technologies require real time. Uh, type, type of uh, computation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in, in the uh, consensus step for committing the last uh, transaction to the blockchain, how does uh, a node uh, know or find out that consensus, 51%, has been reached? Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, so so well, when these tra transactions get, uh, get propagated, uh, that's internal to the protocol. The protocol will let all the other nodes that, that the okay. consensus has been reached. Yeah. Great. And then I just want to clear these questions because they're coming in fast and furious. This is uh, incredible. If we, don't, if we don't move to a peer-to-peer -peer trading, what exactly is the benefit of blockchain as a data structure or a protocol? Um, you said a central authority will exist, which would control access, probably also provide governance. 
is it then more efficient to move to a distributed or a decentralized model of data rather than allowing the central authority to control the ledger? Yeah, that, that, that's a good uh, question. So, uh, so there are a lot of uh, different types of trading <laughs> that go on, but uh, but uh, if in the worst case scenario, I still see swap trading sometimes being done on a phone in, in major organizations, right? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So, so, so in, in some cases. The execution of, so I didn't talk about this too much, right? So when we're talking right. about futures or commodity trading, um, this is contract-based trading. Uh, right. I will promise to sell you this much wheat at this price for this amount of time, right? That could all be 100% automated in, on a blockchain, and that gets into smart contracts, ex execution of trades based on a condition. Right. So um, Here's a Go, go ahead. Go I'm sorry. sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can your ledger be discovered by a hacker who downloads malware like a keystroke logger onto your PC? So a keystroke logger in particular may not uh, will, will not discover the blockchain. But if the malware gets onto your PC and that blockchain is on that PC as, as it would be in a distributed nature, although I think in, in a production implementation it might be in a server somewhere, um, yeah, I mean, uh, if malware gets onto the PC where the blockchain is, so your private blockchain, then yes, a, a, a hacker can absolutely discover that. Um, so it's important to really identify what you're putting on that blockchain. Okay. Um, here's a question. Uh, just a few more. Privacy follow-up. If two parties enter into a transaction and that transaction is logged with the associated wallet address, could those two users or other users somehow connect the dots associated with the wallet addresses with, uh, with at least those two parties? Uh, yes, there are entire business models that are built around this. Yep. That's okay. all I'm allowed to say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. And then, Ulf, you may be handling this. I'm not sure. When it comes to smart contracts, it seems there is an AI capabilities uh, built into it. My question is in regarding to sending money via smart contracts, if an organization wants to pay multiple content affiliates, for example, does blockchain track payments via ledgers and does it automatically release payments to those same entities to ensure proper payments are being sent or received? So it, it can, it can. So, so uh, I want to uh, call it, um, AI uh, may, may source data from the blockchain, but the AI technologies, whether it's um, machine learning based uh, or a human assisted machine learning based or, or something uh, are are actually different technologies. The data source can be the blockchain, and you can apply uh, uh, AI to those data, and you can execute based on certain criteria. So uh, when we're talking about smart contracts in particular, it depends on the implementation of, uh, of the smart contract. An example I like to give is um, if, you, if you have a will to a, to a certain in individual, Right, um, right. And, and that person passes away, that will get entered into a registry. Then that registry would automatically uh, execute all those uh, the provisions in the will automatically. That's that's how a smart contract can work, for example. And and that it could have a uh, you could have AI make those transactions as well. Okay. Okay. A few more. Um, people people don't understand how to separate coins from different public keys, so they often mix known public key transactions from unknown, unadvertised public key transactions. And the assumption here, I guess, is this causes all their um, account public keys to be known. That person knows what they're talking about. Yeah. 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 That's a true statement. Yeah, um, that, that is true. Can you explain, and maybe it's, this is way off topic, but can you explain a Hyperledger versus um, Ethereum frameworks? Are they the same or used as a platform for completely different use cases? Right, so Hyperledger is IBM's uh, um, uh, implementation yeah. of the blockchain. I think it's built on top of Node. Uh, and, uh, and, and Ethereum is also, uh, you can uh, functionally, from a function perspective, you can do the same thing on Ethereum and, and Hi Hi Hyperledger. But the implementation, think, think of them as two different vendors. Um, Hyperledger yeah. also has far, far um, many um, more use cases. Uh, uh, as well, uh, the, we'll just say it's the same because it's based on the same technology. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So two, two, two last questions. How are participants in, in transactions validated? Example in Bitcoin, uh, can someone steal my credentials, my wallet, and initiate a transaction to transfer my funds while eventually uh, remaining anonymous? And how do transactions actually occur between two consenting parties? 
so so this gets into PKI. Um, so uh, in, in Bitcoin, if somebody steals your wallet's credentials, um, uh, so uh, so we have to. There, there are a couple assumptions here. Uh, the, the first assumption is uh, that your wallet is local to your computer, or or is it uh, some somewhere like a Coinbase, right? So if they steal cre credentials to your co Coinbase account, they, that they they can then execute a transaction to one of their accounts, but Again, then that lets you know their accounts, right? Yeah. So, so, so that 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 account is there. And uh, how are transactions done? It's a public-private key infrastructure uh, right. where where you where you guys uh, exchange public keys and assign right. those transactions as necessary. So, last question. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ulf, uh, and this is uh, <laughs> an interesting question. There have been documentaries made on this. Who do you think Satoshi really is? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. There are a lot of people who are trying to uh, trying to find out. I think uh, Satoshi is uh, a crypto geek and a mathematician, uh, yeah. and uh, that that's all I'm comfortable in, in saying. It could also be was... uh, all, all, also we, it could also be uh, multiple people. Uh, let, let's uh, yeah, that's uh, a theory. Out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a, there was on I think it was on Netflix. If you uh, do a search on uh, Netflix or or um, something on uh, Bitcoin, uh, they actually go into trying to run an inve you know, investigative journalist, try to determine if it uh, was an individual, who was it, or was it a collective. Um, so with that off, I'd like to turn it over to you. We're now going to talk about some use cases. Okay, thank you. So it's interesting to see how different industries are uh, jumping in. So we will uh, start oh, to sorry. look at yeah. So so the first uh, comment here is that uh, all industries basically will be impacted uh, sooner or later, uh, and uh, the nature uh, is I would say almost uh, an industry specific process. So it's not like big data or cloud or generic computing models. It's very important to look at what are these industry-specific use cases. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at different industries and and predictions. So uh, we know that the uh, blockchain is, is uh, a trend with, with a huge potential. Uh, Gartner is saying it's a top 10 trend. And most of the potential business cases of blockchain are uh, yet to be proven. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but the interest is growing. And Gartner did uh, a CIO survey this year, and the respondents uh, uh, CIOs, mainly CIOs, 8% uh, uh, of respondents are in short-term planning or experimenting with blockchain. 14% uh, are in mid-term or long-term planning, and only 1% of the CIOs indicate that they actually already deployed the technology. Yeah, we have heard that financial services was the first mover, but government and supply chain um, have now gained uh, quite some momentum. And uh, let's look at the different industries. Okay, good, good. So uh, we, we can see that Gartner is a uh, uh, predicting the maturity uh, time for different industries. So the top four uh, are uh, banking, communications, education, and government with uh, a, a high uh, potential, uh, uh, transformational potential. And mm -hmm. uh, Gartner is saying that it, it will probably take five to 10 years uh, to, to reach maturity. Then we have a, a set of industries that will uh, um, take more time. It will have healthcare, manufacturing, oil and gas, and, and retail. 
Yeah, you see, well, before you go back, go back to that slide. I would have thought, and I'd love to hear from you guys, I would have thought healthcare would have gone for this real quickly in terms of um, private blockchaining of patient records. Because that seems to be a very easy, uh, controllable um, application and environment. Any thoughts on that, guys? I, I think it think the use case is great. Use cases are great for healthcare, but I think they will move pretty slowly. Uh, I tend to agree with Gartner here that it, it, it will take a long time. Okay. Uh, Why? Uh, Why is that? Because you, because healthcare as an industry is just a slow adopter uh, of of uh, technology, or yeah, in many cases they they are okay. uh, moving very slowly. Uh, not not so well funded and not not very technology oriented or mature in, in that area. That that's my take on it. Okay. I agree. Okay. Great. Okay. Keep going. So let's let's take a look here. Um, this is uh, different verticals and the. What Gartner is thinking about uh, their interest, and if, if you uh, do some technology planning, uh, seeking to exploit vertical industry market, uh, then uh, the advice is basically that you should prioritize the industries that that you are um, finding the needs and and readiness for blockchain. Uh, and, and cover the high interest areas that we mentioned before, uh, financial, supply chain, government. And uh, for technology strategic planners seeking to uh, 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 exploit vertical markets, uh, uh, some advice is to prioritize uh, for deeper investments and uh, readiness, uh, uh, expect it to uh, take time uh, to get ready in, in particularly some of the industries that we mentioned before. But it's interesting to see that uh, non-financial use cases uh, uh, are, it's easy to uh, list 30 different uh, use cases that are not uh, financial oriented. Uh, for example, gaming, gambling, we have companies like First Blood, uh, Ethereum. We have government and organizational governance like BitNation. Uh, you have IoT, uh, for example, the data broker, DIO, um, Filament, Stock.it. Then, then you have another industry here uh, we use case for job market where you have the coinality for example <clears throat> you have uh, an industry like uh, land registry you have the uh, licensing for example license stock rocks you have media uh, where that uh, you you probably uh, have heard about public uh, you have the mining uh, uh, companies like Waves. You have network infrastructure. You have uh, open organizations, business-related uh, collaboration. You have uh, operating systems. Uh, that industry like uh, JamOS uh, by Jam. You have um, real estate recording. Like Silverton, uh, you have reputation verification and ranking, uh, like Thanks Coin. You have Rideshare as one industry, uh, with the, for example, Arcade City. You have supply chain management, uh, like Fact Tom. You have traceability of food products uh, and supply chain audit. For example, provenance is represented there. And 
Yeah, I, I think that it, one way to look at this. Let's get the next one here. Uh, here, here are uh, a couple of the ones that I mentioned. Uh, and if one way to look at this is, uh, like Gartner did, uh, divide it in four different areas or four types a a at the top. Uh, and, and they are capturing the primary ways of using blockchain. We have, um, a, I think we mentioned briefly that before you implement uh, a solution, you need to check if there's a really valid business case uh, as, uh, as a warning. And a Gartner's model of, of these four types of blockchain initiative is a result of a basically research on a publicly announced initiatives. And they, um, we, we can see these value drivers in the table here. It shows that business value encompasses both tangible and intangible items, including economic value, customer value, employee value, social value. And it, it, it shows that it, some value drivers are typically used together. And uh, if, if you want to uh, look deeper in, in, into these results, uh, check out the hype cycle for blockchain. Uh, yeah, well, where where are we? Uh, yeah, you're referring to the Gartner hype uh, hype uh, hype curve. Would you say we're at the top of it or coming down off of it? Um, I I think it's very early stages. We are uh, we're getting to the peak where the hype yeah. is high. Uh, yeah. And and I think the rest of the curve will. Uh, it takes some time to climb up to you know the productivity uh, right. level. And, and then, the for anyone who's not familiar, the Gartner hype cycle uh, curve is like uh, like a bell curve that ramps up real quick and then falls down, and then starts to rise up and flattens out at a normal to the plateau state. productivity plateau, yeah, yeah. which is much lower than the height of the curve uh, yeah. at, at the top of the bell. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have talked about a couple of, uh, briefly mentioned a couple of industries here. And uh, let's look at one example. Uh, this is an interesting example. This is uh, actually what was happening in, uh, in the mining. You're tracking diamonds from mine to financial customer. Uh, it, 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 it's a complicated process and uh, this is actually an example of how uh, how it works in 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 this industry. Uh, reference to an IBM study. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have the famous uh, Bitcoin example, and yeah. uh, uh, th there are so many different uh, uh, companies coming up with. with uh, with uh, a similar model, starting with a wallet and the network broadcast that uh, Peter talked about, yep. to the pool of transactions and the consensus mechanism that that, that we talked a lot about earlier, uh, and and then uh, in, into confirmation in in the ledger, and and uh, you get back in the in the wallet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I would add, I would add to that that from a from a hacking point of view, if you go back to your slide, um, most attacks on I don't want to say just uh, blockchain, but it specifically to um, uh, cryptocurrencies happen within the wallet, because that's the easiest way to grab the Bitcoin. Is if your wallet's not constructed uh, in a secure fashion, it's it's. Usually, it's the implementation of it, it is. the crypto of the cryptographic uh, processes that a hacker. Uh, I, I agree. Go ahead, the, the, the pro protocol 
right. like in this case, it's a solid, uh, great protocol, but it, it can be, uh, uh, as you alluded to, implementation flaws that right. are uh, usually where you find security issues and, and attack surfaces. Right. Yeah, I would agree. So um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I wanted to uh, thank um, Peter and Ulf for this session. This is a very complicated topic. We could have easily taken just the hashing aspect of this. And maybe we'll do that. If the audience would like to uh, provide me some feedback, I'd love to hear it. Um, and really drill down on just the hashing and get into some of the crypto on it um, yeah. and, and, and a Merkle tree. We could have a whole session on just that. That would be very technical, um, highly mathematically uh, oriented, uh, but we, we, can, we can make it understandable. If that's something you guys would like to hear about, let me know. Um, I want, again, it's thank interesting. You, uh, yeah, Quant I think it would. I think it would. And, and, you know, we, we mentioned uh, quantum computing, yeah, um, yeah. I think that, that that can be a very interesting. Very I, I interesting agree. Also. I agree. So again, thank you to uh, Peter and Ulf and the audience. You guys, uh, you guys tested my uh, ability to jockey and answer uh, all of your questions. The 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 slides will be made available. Um, if you if you email me, I'll, I'll send send them to you. But this is also recorded, and you can play it back and view it uh, as well. Again, uh, this is Dave Morris from um, the uh, Cybersecurity, the No Spin Zone. And stay tuned. We've got a lot more coming up uh, over the course of the year. Uh, thank you. Thank you both, Peter and all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.